Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, this is kind of a bit of an experiment. Uh, several years ago, whenever Jasco partnered with Shadowbox Live for uh, the Tenshu, which was in a adaption of Tenshu Monogatari, so the Japanese folk tales, there were some related lectures that happened at Ohio State University at the time. There were the, some of the performers um, went to OSU and gave some lectures there. And whenever I met with uh, Stacy Board, executive director of Shadow uh, Box Live, you know, four or five months ago at this point, whenever we were in the planning stages of Circle of Blood, uh, we thought it'd be really interesting to see what we could do this time around. Uh, because this has many similar connections, but at the same time is a very different sort of show. So what we're gonna be doing this week and at the same time next week is going to be just exploring the general influences that the Japanese influences that you can find in the Circle of Blood show, but also in the graphic novel Kabuki that inspired the show. Uh, so first off, for a sense of who's seen the show so far? Are you seeing it soon? Tonight. Tonight, okay. So there will be no spoilers in this show, so you're okay. Uh, anything we cover is in the program on the website, or will be talked about within the first 10 minutes of the show. So nothing we're gonna talk about today will spoil the show. Who has read the graphic novel upon which this is based? Just one, okay, two. <laughs> That's great, because we're gonna be looking today as much at the original graphic novel, first published in 1994, as the play that is being presented you know, several times a week. It's a very interesting play, uh, graphic novel too because it's author David Mack, who is the writer and illustrator of this graphic novel, started writing it whenever he was in college. He went to Northern Kentucky University and he was studying Japanese uh, language. So he actually studied abroad in Japan for a period of time and is taking the Japanese culture course, courses, art courses that tend to be offered at the college level. And all of these influences made their way into Circle of Blood. So this week, we're going to be looking at more of the theatrical influences uh, with myself. For those who have never met before, my name is Ben Packer. I'm the executive director of JASCO. I'm also an ethnomusicologist specializing in Japanese music. So this allows me a chance to kind of bridge some of those worlds a little bit. And we're going to be talking about Japanese theatrical influences today. Next week, we're going to be focusing more on Japanese art. We have a Japanese art historian coming in to talk about the visual influences. So with the combination of these two, we're hoping to present a nice overview of what David Mack integrated into his original work, and then what was then taken and adapted for the stage for Circle of Blood. Now I will begin by showing, this is a, the summary of the play that is in every program. So with this body of knowledge, this is presented to you before the show even starts. Um, don't worry, I'll read it. So the, the play is set in an alternate near future Japan where a young woman codenamed Kabuki acts as an agent and television law enforcement personality for a government body known as the No. The agency exists to hunt down and brutally execute criminals for their misdeeds under the veil of keeping the peace. Kabuki is one of five assassins that receive orders from the devil who in turn receives orders from the No. One of the board members is the General. In the past, the General fell in love with a woman named Tsukiko during an unspecified war. The General's son, Kai, became incredibly jealous of the General's new love. He attacks and assaults her, leaving her blind and pregnant and then disappears. Tsukiko dies while giving birth to Kabuki, and the General raises Kabuki as his own daughter. Kai returns when Kabuki is a little girl and attacks her at her mother's grave, carving the Chinese characters that spell Kabuki on her face. The general decides to train Kabuki as a fighter and turns her into a living weapon. Kai leaves Japan and gains a reputation as a criminal kingdom. With rumors of Kai's return, will Kabuki finally get justice? Will she find peace or will she forever be trapped inside this circle of love? So that is the summary that sets the scene for Circle of Blood, and also sets the scene for Kabuki, the original graphic novel, the subtitle, the first volume is Circle of Blood. I want to focus on this first paragraph a little bit though, because there's three primary elements out of the beginning of this summary 
that set the stage for this entire play, not just in terms of characterization and setting, but also theme. And that's a lot of what we're going to be looking at today are these themes. Some of the underlying things that are motivating the characters, and more importantly, motivating the plot. So we're going to highlight three things in particular. So this is set in an alternate near future Japan. There's a character named Kabuki, and she is a member of a group called the Note. So these are what I'm going to be looking at today. These three elements, which may seem simple, are actually incredibly complex and reveal a lot about the thoughts that are going into Circle of Blood, which then was taking elements from Kabuki. We're going to begin by this idea of an alternate new near future Japan. In the play, it takes place in a place called Neo Tokyo. Now, this idea of something taking place in just a little bit in the future, just near future Japan, is something you actually see quite a lot in Japanese pop culture. Uh, particularly from the 80s moving forward, whenever you started to see the influence of cyberpunk, a particular sci science fiction genre, making its way into Japanese pop culture, uh, manga, anime, cinema, and so forth. But the setting is very important. So the setting is Neo-Tokyo. So Neo-Tokyo is a very specific marker within Japanese pop culture. It was first used in 1982 with a seminal manga called Akira, or sometimes you hear it referred to as Akira, Akira in the West. Um, Akira is seen as one of the most important novel um, manga series in the last 30, 40 years in Japan. Uh, particularly because the anime adaption of it, which was released in 1988, is one of those elements that helped really skyrocket Japanese culture in the United States to another level with its release. But the idea of Neo-Tokyo is very important. Uh, because there's this idea of a near future Japan where the cities have become more technologically advanced, the society have become more technologically advanced, but those achievements are often juxtaposed by a breakdown in the social order, um, an increase in criminal activity, an increasing um, unrest among the youth. All of these things tend to become imbued within this idea of something taking place and in Neo-Tokyo. Uh, so just to give you a set of the setting, I want to play a brief 20 second clip from Akira. It will kind of give you a sense of the visual aesthetic that David Mack was drawing upon whenever he decided to use the term Neo-Tokyo. <laughs> seconds kind of hard to say but it's neon it's like the same sort of buildings we have now only more bigger and taller and more compact together but with it has this criminal element that goes beneath it so it's a little minor thing but this idea of neo tokyo really helps to show the world in which circle blood and kabuki takes place now it's actually really interesting because in the original graphic novel, it took place not in Neo-Tokyo, but in Neo-Kyoto. Uh, Kyoto is the ancient capital of, J of Japan. It was up until the uh, 1800s. It, to this day, it has a older aesthetic. If Tokyo represents new, modern Japan, Kyoto represents old, classic, court, traditional culture of Japan. But this idea of Neo-Tokyo in the play, in Neo-Kyoto in the graphic novel becomes even more so because Neo-Kyoto means it's become like Tokyo. It's become industrialized, modernized, but there's this criminal element, so there's a perversion of what used to be in Japan. It's not really important for the grand scheme of things, but I thought that change is interesting because it's relying on certain aesthetics that Westerners are more familiar with. People are going to be more familiar with the idea of Tokyo, and if they're familiar with Akira and other 
manga and anime that use that title, they're going to be more familiar with that than Neo Kyoto. But nevertheless, that change is very interesting. It's the fact that it's in Kyoto, in the original graphic novel, is very important. The idea that there's something, there's a perversion of, of traditional Japan happening. And that's a common theme that we're not really going to talk a whole lot about today, but it's something that really runs through the entire of Circle of Blood. If you have any questions at any time, raise your hand. Um, I can just keep going on forever for this, but if you have any questions, don't hold it till the end. I'd be, I'd be happy to uh, answer them at any time. So we have this taking place in Neo Tokyo or Neo Kyoto. And in this world, we have Kabuki. It is the main character, not just a circle of blood, but the entire series. The graphic novel, its overall title is Kabuki. And every sub-story has its own subtitle. So the first story was Circle of Blood. And they've taken that. And then other titles go after that. Uh, the latest volume was just released, I'm going to say, three or four years ago. The very interesting thing about these stories is that David Mack changes his artwork for every single story. So this very stylized black and white artwork that he uses in Circle of Blood, and you see on the back, whenever you see the play, is not present anywhere else. It's completely different. Sometimes they'll actually have other artists come in as well for dramatic effect. There's one story where each assassin's elements of the story is drawn by a different artists. Get a different aesthetic to the story. But nevertheless, it's underneath the overall title of Kabuki, with Kabuki, the character, being, being the main character. And her name is very, very important. Um, for those of you who may be aware, Kabuki is a type of Japanese theater. And today we're going to be talking about these Japanese theatrical influences. And it was not just a random choice to use the word Kabuki to name the character. Her name and her usage of her name has a very particular meaning and purpose. So, Kabuki is a type of dance drama, to be more specific. It's a type of theatrical stage performance that combines acting, singing, and dancing. It's actually embedded within the name itself. Kabuki, the word, is made out of three characters. And they're only read as such with this particular word. The first one, Ka, I guess, means singing. The middle one, Bu, means dance. The last one, Ki, means skill. Or we can take it to mean acting at this point. So what you see in the style, of, in the genre, is embedded within the word itself. Now to become important. Now, Kabuki emerged in the 1500s, uh, sorry, the 15th century in Japan, but it really had its heyday from the 16th to 19th century during what's called the Edo Jidai era, the Edo era of Tokyo, of Japan, when Tokyo and other cities, with the exception of Nagasaki, were. Okay. Caught that. <laughs> were caught off uh, from. Western sport. So Kabuki was the people's entertainment. It's comprised of all male casts. Uh, the result of many scandals that happened actually started as an entirely female uh, cast. Then the female uh, actors became very popular, not just as actors, but also as companions. I'll leave it at that. Uh, so eventually it was banned. And then it was reopened as an all-male cast. They also became popular. So it was banned for a while at that point. Then it came back with very strict restrictions, and it's in that format that it's largely succeeded to this point. So we have a brief video that I want to show. This is a, a clip from NHK World. NHK is the Japanese National Broadcasting Association. Um, NHK World is their international division. And this is from a uh, clip from a TV show talking about Kabuki. I like this clip because it gives you an idea of some of the visual aesthetics for it, but also it talks a little bit about the themes, what sort of plays you actually see uh, in Kabuki. <laughs> Thank you. 
There are about 400 Kabuki players. They fall into two general categories. First, there are historical dramas. They're based on incidents in history that took place well before Kabuki itself existed. This is a play called Yoshitsune and the Thousand Cherry Trees. Its main character is the 12th century general Minamoto no Yoshitsune, and it features many fight scenes. The other type of kabuki play is the domestic melodrama. These plays were based on well-known murders, love-related suicides, and other action events. They closely reflect social conditions of the Edo period, from the 17th to 19th centuries. This play is known in English as Benten Kozo. It tells the story of five themes, and Benten Kozo is one of them. Its popularity comes from its punchy dialogue. One highlight is when the five thieves exchange lines with a special rhythm and cadence. senses of the word. Um, the stage craft is very technically complex at times. Very big stages. Um, if anyone's ever seen uh, the Miserable on Broadway, one of its major points is that it has a rotating stage. Um, that's actually something they got from Kabuki, where some of the largest Kabuki stages will have a completely rotating stage to allow them to have multiple uh, sets at the same time. They also will have flying mechanisms, the ability for people to pop out of the floor. Uh, they will have huge I mean, props. Uh, it's a very elaborate stage setting. It's also very stylized in how they act and how they talk. Everything is prescribed. There's a certain rhythm to how they talk, and that's dictated partially by the script but also by the type of character. Uh, but there's also a way that they move. So there are prescribed motions, like a mie, for example. So if I go back to this scene. So notice right there, he moved for a second, then he stopped. It's called a mie. The sole purpose is for him to look cool. And he moves, so it's a very visually um, influenced, uh, art form, it's, it's visually, very visually aware as well of how it looks on stage. And of course, the visuals have a major part in this because these are very elaborate costumes and makeup designs. Uh, what is probably one of the most famous parts of Kabuki is its visual element. And it's that visual element that's actually really influenced um, the graphic novel Kabuki as well as Circle of Blood. So if we move forward a little bit, <coughs> all actors in Kabuki performance, that is the, it's going to be very hard to keep going back and forth, um, and the theatrical genre Kabuki have their faces painted. And the face paint depends on the type of character. And that not just a matter of the basic face paint, but also the colors that are used. On the left hand side here, we have a warrior type. Top right hand side here, we have a woman. And bottom right hand side here, we have just a regular human character. It's probably more of a government diplomat, someone of some importance. 
but every single type of character has a different facial paint. And even within these three major categories, there are many sub-categories. Uh, to give a case in point of the warrior type, because whenever people think of Kabuki, it's this style of face paint that people typically think of. Um, the colors themselves are of very great importance. A bright red character like this indicates a, hearful, a, a powerful hero role. Uh, bright uh, red is a symbol, a uh, color of virtue and power. Somebody with a black beard, maybe purple and blue colors, will be a villain. They typically have eyebrows that kind of look antler-like is how they're described, how they're painted on. Uh, if someone has blue makeup, they're a ghost. Or spirit, or some other magical magical creature. Um, often, the color blue represents negative emotions like jealousy or fear, and a lot of times, ghosts in these roles <coughs> are trapped by their attachment to the world, and their presence in the plays is a result of this attachment. They're looking for something, or one of the major characters is looking to exercise these ghosts. So these negative spirits are very important to the idea of the ghost itself. And then you have grays or browns that are kind of used for eh, anything else. Animals, oni or demons or yokai or monsters or something inhuman. So the colors themselves mean something. The style of the makeup itself means something. This visual aesthetic was copied directly by David Mack whenever he created his characters. So if we look at the Assassins of the No, which there are five in the stage adaption, there's eight in the original graphic novel. If you look at their faces, the way that their masks are designed, and their masks, they're not just faces, these are actually masks, are very similar to, the top half is kind of similar to how the warrior um, type was made, if we look at that as a comparison. If we break these in two halves, the top half is very similar to the male warrior aesthetic, while the bottom half is very close to the female aesthetic. So it's an interesting visual trait. Now, the rest of their costumes have no influence whatsoever from Kabuki. Um, you'll see it if you see the player, if you read the original graphic novel, it's very, there's a wide variety of it in terms of how, where the costume influences are. But nevertheless, this first look, you can tell immediately, okay, there's a visual connection to Kabuki plays. Perhaps more importantly, though, is the thematic connection. So we talked earlier how um, Tsukiko was taken from her family. She was a, a slave of the general and his troops. Eventually the general was entranced by her. Something that's not mentioned in the stage play, but it's very important to the understanding of everything, is that um, they, were, they were originally conscripted to be uh, comfort women, prostitutes in the service of the, of the army. This is supposed to take place in World War II. It's whenever this original story took. However, this particular group of women underneath the general were not prostitutes, but instead were asked to perform kabuki. So the general fell in love with uh, Tsukiko, Kabuki's mother, by watching her perform kabuki plays. And if you remember in that video, it talked about how one of the major themes of kabuki plays are historical dramas, war dramas, dramas about historical military heroes. And it's said in the graphic novel that the general would watch these for comfort, for solace, but also for inspiration. So he had them perform plays that had a very militaristic element. The morals at the same time are about the transitory nature of this world. So something that comes from Buddhism. Or the importance of duty, something that comes from Confucianism. So the general was looking for these ideals, and for that reason, had these women perform kabuki. 
Now, Tsukiko Kabuki's mother often played a ghost. And this is very, very, very important. This is actually kind of crucial to the main message of Circle of Blood as a whole. Her final role was a woman who would return from the next world to avenge her family. She was a vengeful spirit. A lot of times in Kabuki, the ghosts that are present are vengeful spirits. They are there looking to right a wrong that was enacted upon them whenever they were still living. Sometimes they just return to this realm as is. Sometimes they actually possess the living. Now if you think about what are Kabuki's um, motivations in this story, both in the original graphic novel and on stage, it's revenge. Get, get revenge on Kai. Also, it's mentioned that, if we go all the way back here, So, whenever Kabuki was a little girl, she was attacked by Kai. Left for dead in her mother's grave. With characters that spelled Kabuki on her face. Kai saw all these Kabuki women as immoral and not being used for what they were supposed to be used. So the idea of Kabuki was itself, it was an insult. So this just is a reminder of where she came from. But more important is the fact that she was left for dead on her mother's grave. Um, I'm going to come back to add that in a little bit, but that's very, very, very important. <laughs> Let me move back here. So, Tsukiko, something of interest. This is actually something that's used directly. This is from the gra original graphic novel. You notice on the left hand side, we have Tsukiko's original, or her, her last ever uh, stage costume. It's actually um, a Japanese imperial military flag. Um, the uh, Kyoku Jitsutaki. So it's a particular, it's, this was the flag that was flying in all military bases and, and institutions across Asia in World War II. They dressed the uh, characters in these because they had no other clothes by the end of World War II. But you know, if you notice, Kabuki also has the elements of the flag on her foot, on her costume. This is not by accident. There's an immediate connection on many different levels between Tsukiko and Kabuki, whose real name is Ukiko. Um, so there are a lot of connections here, but just that is not, that means something. Again, we're going to come back to that later. But before we do that, I'm going to talk about the fact that Kabuki is in Neo to uh, Kyoto or Neo Tokyo working for a, a organization called the No. So this is also, as many of you may know, this is also a form of Japanese theater. This is the medieval theater of Japan. Where Kabuki is something that came into its um, prime in the 16th through 19th century. Uh, no was really developed in the 14th and 15th century. And the plays that are performed today are largely the same as they were 500 years ago, 600 years ago. They have remained largely untouched. It's also a combination of singing, dancing, and drama, although rather than painted faces, there are masks on the main characters. And it's very slow, solemn, and minimalistic. Kabuki has these very complex stages and costumes. As you will see in this video, no, it does not. <laughs> that she is actually a ghost. The woman 
Lemon recounts the story of her life. She married a man she had known since they were children. He was unfaithful to her, but she loved him in spite of this, and her love eventually won him back. We learn that the woman's husband, too, is dead. After completing her reminiscences, she departs. That night, as the monk sleeps, the woman's ghost appears to him in a dream. She has dressed herself in her husband's clothes and arranged her hair to resemble his. She recalls their years together, then dances. in the well and pines for the pleasant days she and her husband spent together. When dawn comes, the woman vanishes. Even in death, she longs to see her husband again. It is a tale of eternal love. It is a very slow performance art. Minimalistic, where there is nothing on stage beyond the performers, the musicians, the Hayashi, and then to the right, or stage, uh, stage right. There is, sorry, stage left, there is a uh, chorus. It's kind of like actually, it functions both as a Greek chorus, but also to take over the singing whenever the actor dances. There's typically no more than at most three people on stage at any one time. One of the interesting things about it is it has a very particular construction in terms of how plays are arranged. It's called johaku in Japanese. There's a very slow build over a period of time. You have the introduction of the primary character in the first section, the jo. In the ha, you have the introduction of the secondary character, the antagonist, although that's typically kind of difficult to deal with. Um, and then the introduction of the conflict in the main purpose of the play. That's the ha. That's the middle section, which is typically the longest section as well. Then at the very end, you have the climax, the cue. So this three-act structure, which gets faster and builds momentum over time, is something that is a major feature of no plays. And actually, uh, Circle of Blood is the the uh, stage play, but also the original graphic novel is very much created in a Joel Haku style. If you read it, you can break it down and the divisions work very well in the manner in which characters are introduced and the manner in which plot develops. It's all very clear within that three act style with a very sudden ending with the cue and then it's the end and that develops. An interesting thing about the ending and this is going to be major, it's kind of, okay, I have to talk a bit, it's quasi-spoiler, I'm sorry. Uh, but the plays typically end with some sort of pathos. It's very rarely a happy ending. Um, even if there's a happy ending, there's a tinge of sadness or something added into it. So take that as you will for the stage play if you haven't seen it, but that's present. So thematically speaking, there's a lot of themes. But also, Notice they were talking about a ghost story. Just as Kabuki is filled, I mean, filled with ghost stories, No is filled with ghost stories as well. We'll talk that, about that in a second, but first I want to mention the fact that the primary No um, actors are wearing masks, just as the assassins of the No all have their own masks. Now the difference is, is that in no theater, the masks are very, pl so plain is a bad way to put it, but they're supposed to be ambiguous in their expressions. But there are still three primary types of masks. 
there is uh, the Hanya, the demon, we have on, one on the left hand side. Uh, one of the main characters in Circle of Blood, whose name is the, de the demon, we mentioned before, that's his mask. It's not different at all, it is a Hanya, outright. Uh, there's also a standard female mask up here on the right hand side. You won't see anybody in Circle of Blood wearing that, but that's one of those common types of masks. And then the bottom right hand side, we have a character, a, um, a, um, a god mask, which you actually see in the original graphic novel. It's not something that is, it's a character that was removed from the adaption, uh, from the stage adaption, but it's a character that's present in the graphic novel and has a very important role in the graphic novel. So it's a kind of shame that they are moved from at the same time. Um, they had to remove it. We, if we have time, I could talk about that a little bit. But his presence is not missed, but it is missed at the same time. But never, nevertheless, you will see that mask on stage. And this is a demon, so you can kind of have an idea. Maybe it's not a good person. So that can give you some sense of something. But let's compare it to the masks of the gnome. These are the eight assassins of the gnome. You only will see five of them on stage. You'll see Kabuki, um, I'm trying to remember, Tiger Lily, Snap, um, Snapdragon, Buto, and it's either Ice or Scarab. I can't recall one of the other ones. Um, but, so they all have masks, but they're not a mask in a no sense of the word. But they just borrow the idea of the no. But at the same time, there's still no sense of emotion on their faces. These are very emotionless masks, with the exception of Kabuki, who has a single tear on her mask. And there's actually a shot in the original graphic novel of Tsukiko, her mother, with a tear in the exact same place. So that tear is meant to represent, again, mirror her mother. That image keeps, that idea keeps returning. And again, that's very important. And here's, just to prove, here's the demon, the, 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 the demon character, whose name is only in the original graphic novel, and his mask. It's the exact same thing. Now, Kabuki, the, graph, the stage play, is one of the major visual influences on Circle of Blood and on Kabuki, the original graphic novel. But thematically speaking, it's a no play, through and through. It has a Joe Haku element that we talked about before. But perhaps more importantly is the fact that it's a, it's a ghost story. It's an onryo, the story of an onryo, a vengeful spirit. Many of these plays in the no repertoire are of vengeful ghosts and them coming to this realm. They're often sometimes about deceased warriors also seeking salvation. But the vengeful spirit ones are more important. Kabuki Circle of Blood is a vengeful spirit play. And what that means, I'll mention in a second, but it is a vengeful spirit play about a woman who is seeking revenge for something that was uh, about a wrong that happened to her whenever she was alive. So, remember, Tsukiko was killed by Kai. She played a ghost in her final role. Kabuki was attacked by Kai and left for dead at her mother's grave. In the graphic novel, it mentions that Kabuki was dead for six minutes. Kabuki came back to life. But K Kabuki takes it one step further. She starts to think that she was the reincarnation of her mother's ghost. That she was possessed by her mother's ghost. For the purpose of seeking revenge on Kai. It's a Kabuki, it's a no ghost story, vengeful spirit story, through and through. So all these visual influences start making sense. Starting here. So we have a direct visual link between Kabuki and her mother in terms of the costume. And then also the element that I don't show where there's the single tier in the exact same place. And then the idea that she believes that 
she was returned as a ghost. You can actually see it right here. Whenever she died, I'll just read this. It may be a little hard to read. Because while I was dead, I saw my mother. The large circular overhead lights in the operating room faded into the gentle haze of the full moon. My mother stood in the fields. She told me that I must return as a ghost like her role in the Kabuki dramas. I will honor my mother. Kabuki sees herself as a ghost in this world looking to enact revenge on Kam. Whenever you realize that, you start breaking down the circle of blood and Kabuki and the original graphic novel, it lines up very well. Um, the original comic actually takes this to another level. There's a whole discussion between two characters about ventral spirit stories. David Mack does not hide it at all. He is quite forthcoming with his influences and the type of story that this is. Um, the main more specific, they talk about how the dramas form, and they're talking about no at this point, nearly invariable, has the ghost disguised as human in the first half of the play, the latter half being devoted to its recognition and subsequent exorcism, but not before vengeance is served. That he mentions these fearsome divas are abound in woodblock prints, manga, airwaves, theater, silver screen, and in the minds of men who see her. So these idea of ventral spirit stories have made their way from No and Kabuki are present in manga, anime, Japanese cinema. It's a staple of the theatrical tradition. And it's completely 100% present in Circle of Blood. Those who have seen it already, you probably, probably maybe start to put these connections together. If whenever you're going to see it tonight, think about that. Because it will, unfortunately, kind of mean you probably see where some things are going, but it's all these influences that David Mack had whenever he was creating Kabuki. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. If you have any questions, I can answer that, or I can talk about that one element that wasn't brought up before, because I didn't know if we'd have time. So before we maybe get into that, do you have any questions? No, nope, if not, then. So this is important. So I mentioned there's one major thing that was left out of the play. Um, Kabuki is an Ainu, and her mother is an Ainu. So, so this idea, um, for, for context, Ainu are um, a ethnic group in Japan that have been persecuted for centuries at this point, and now live only in Hokkaido, the northernmost island in Japan. Tsukiko and others like her were taken from Hokkaido to the islands of Okinawa, um, and so there's one of the other few islands where they are forced to perform um, kabuki, but there's this idea that there's separation. It's another reason why Kai did not like um, Tsukiko, because she was not you know, Yamato, she was not of that clan. She was an Ainu. So she was seen as impure, and the fact that uh, that the general was becoming in love with her, he thought it dishonored the memory of his mother. So that's another reason why he had that grudge. But it becomes a little more important because the character that wears this is an Ainu person who sent it to be uh, Kabuki's grandfather and is the one that helps Kabuki realize what her true purpose of all this is. Makes her understand that if she, you know, if she wants vengeance, then she will have her vengeance according on her own terms. And, but understand the legacy of everything that comes with her and allows her to embrace um, all the different identities that are given her. Because another major point that's not discussed in the, gra in the play, but is discussed in the graphic novel, is this idea of the mask being the true visage of Kabuki. Or is it or is it not? And Kabuki often grasps, uh, grapples with this sense of identity about if whether the, the scarred face is her or if the perfect mask is her. And she's eventually convinced to throw it away. She uses it, she understands it, and this is something she grapples with throughout the graphic novel series back and forth but it ties greatly into no approaches to performance, no actor's performance. You wear this mask 
and you submit to it. You submit to the character. You're supposed to not just try to perform the role of a woman or a general or a vengeful spirit or an Oni or somebody. You are to become that character. So the mask is essential to the sense of identity. And this is something that comes in and out of the graphic novels at different times. Again, I cannot fault anybody for removing that because it's very hard to do in a two-hour play whenever you can't talk about having any internal dialogue more than it already does. But it's something that's very essential to understanding the presence of no influences in Circle of Blood and on the character Kabuki. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating. I just read this first out and then did my research and then read it again, did a little more research and read it a third time. And each time, it becomes fairly obvious. David Mack did his homework. He was a very good student of Japanese mythology and Japanese theater and Japanese art and integrated all into the state, the, her, his graphic novels. And Shadow Boss Live has done an amazing job of incorporating all those influences into the stage play as well. So um, there's still time actually to see the show if, you have, if you've already seen it, but are interested in seeing it again. Uh, because I guarantee you, you will see it with a different part of vision. Um, every single time I see it, I recognize something differently because suddenly my mind is drawn to another influence. Um, these names mean something too, but <laughs> um, one of the characters, Buto, that's a form of Japanese dance. On stage, he's a dancer kills while dancing. So it's actually very interesting. There's little subtle influences like that. Um, Siamese are twins who are joined at the shoulder and each have ma 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 magnetic hands. The, the names have meaning. And different characters are, are um, highlighted at different points of the extended graphic novel series. So everything, there's a deeper meaning in pretty much everything in this story. With that, uh, we've kind of reached the end of the presentation. We do have a few minutes left if anybody has any questions about it. Please. My question, I guess, is the, um, the role of the TV um, newscast. Mm. Could you talk about that? Because it's kind of interesting. So in the original graphic novel um, and in the stage play, the no are this shadow organization that are controlling crime, but they also serve to be like television newscasters. Um, with the idea that it's kind of, it's not, there's hints that it's, it's a very tightly controlled state. Little sister is watching. Turn that into big brother is watching, then you go 1984 and everything. So I think that that element, uh, David Mack was drawn very excessively from the idea of big brother in 1984. He probably read V for Vendetta, which is an Alan Moore graphic novel um, that was published by DC in the, in the um, 1980s, where a character with a mask would often uh, come on, on the screen unannounced. He was a revolutionary in that element. But um, saying that he's watching and that he's going to right the wrongs of the government, and at that point it's drawing a lot from 1984. So in that sense, um, I think he's drawing more from Big Brother concept, and just turning Little Sister is watching. And I love how they used it on stage, because the idea of the newscast and having Kabuki speak. Um, she's also, in the story, it's something that's briefly discussed, but she is a quasi-celebrity because of this. She is anonymous because of the degree of fame that she has. She can walk in the streets in costume because other people have bought her costumes and wear it. So even this, the newscast has a role it's in, this, in the play. She's able to move around. They all are because they're quasi-heroes. Of course, that gets used for different purposes, but um, it, it allows for her to do what she does on both sides of the spectrum. But it's, very, it's a very interesting narrative uh, concept as well.
it's really fun to see how it's used. Anything specific with the weather? She gives these really precise weather reports for Kyoto. It well, start raining at nine o'clock in the morning. That's very true. They do do that. Um, that was probably Dave. If I had to venture a guess, it's probably Dave and Mac watching the degree to which weather reports are very important on Japanese television. Um, ever present, everywhere. Um, if you're on the, if you're riding the train, if there's a screen, we'll have a weather report. Um, and it's very detailed too, just like so. It probably is a, it's a nice little homage to that, but also probably also speaking to the degree to which there's amount of control in the society, um, enacted upon society by the men. So if I had to venture a guess, it's probably something about it. He's never really spoken about it, but it would make sense to have something in that direction. Yeah. So if that's the case, um, again, if you've seen the play already, I highly recommend seeing it again. They're actually having a two for one special. I have information, um, so you can get see tickets again, um, and you, it would not it will be a completely different experience. If you haven't seen it, um, I hope. We haven't spoiled it for you, but at the same time, I hope you get something deeper out of it because it's it's a fascinating story. Uh, next week.